there's, there's three parts to this talk. The first part is really brief, uh, and it's a kind of philosophical positioning of where this, the tradition out of which I'm speaking, uh, in its difference from the current uh, object-oriented tradition, shall we say. Um, the second part is a kind of condensed critical genealogy of contemporary art as post-conceptual art in order to establish the character of the concept of art, which is at stake in the fourth. Now will allow me to say something very briefly about aesthetics, and that will make a connection to um, the Shulam's talk. Um, but the main part is an attempt to give an account of uh, <coughs> what I think of as the emergent historical ontology of the archive uh, as no longer just the afterlife of art, but also as a, a, a primary means or mode of the life of art. Right? So the historical claim is that there's a move from afterlife to life. Right? Um, so that, that's going to be the claim. Uh, so, the first, uh, this brief philosophical position is really about the, the notion of historical ontology, really, which is what's at stake here. Um, so, there's been, there's been a lot of writing uh, about objects uh, of like, the last decade, uh, in particular, uh, of objects and things. And there's been a wide variety of philosophical conceptions of objects and things uh, proposed in that literature, although largely contained within uh, what I think of as a, of a singular but rather thick thread, uh, which is essentially a trajectory of, of post-Heideggerian, post-Deleuzian, post baduian post post uh, philosophy. Where well, that's not a kind of uh, that's not three arbitrary related aspects of it, but it's actually a, a distinct thread. In other words, it's a tradition that reads Deleuze uh, coming out of Heidegger and a of Badiou in a way of modifying the Deleuzean ontology. So it draws on Badiouian and. Deleuzean uh, takes on post heideggerian ontology. So I think if this is a single field, in a way, defined by those two thinkers. And so within that field, that field includes Bruno Latour, for example, uh, in the movement from actor network theory to the more recent modes of existence. Latour's trajectory, I take to be wholly internal to this uh, and quite constitutive of these different these different object-oriented schools. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, it's true of Tristan, of course, because form and object is like one of the books uh, that do this. Okay, so I'm going to distinguish myself from this school. <laughs> so personally, I am doubtful uh, that what in the, in the first line of his book, when Christian Tristan, sorry, says, our time is that of an epidemic of things, right? I, I'm dubious as to whether this is true. Uh, in any philosophical sense of the word, it may be a time of things, but I, I, I don't think it's a time of things in the, any philosophical sense of the word thing. But I'm inclined to agree uh, in relation to this alleged epidemic of things that there is a virus which has been caught by a certain recent French philosophy and its extended, extended uh, field, if you like, uh, of infection. Uh, a virus of the thing, which also uh, includes what I think of as, as an intriguing infatuation, an intriguing French infatuation with the early years of English language analytical philosophy. So for those of us who were taught English language analytical philosophy in the 70s, in which it appeared as a wholly conservative and reactionary uh, establishment phenomenon, there's something intriguing about this revitalization of early 20th century uh, English language analytical philosophy. 
Uh, moreover, what I want to suggest is that in succumbing to this epidemic of things, it's possible that this philosophy, uh, rather than, if you like, making a connection to what appears at the beginning of Tristan's book in this phrase, our time, right? I think this phrase, our time, is wholly and admirably Hegelian. There's no other way, really, of understanding this. It's our time. Um, but I think in, in succumbing to the epidemic of things, this literature is in danger of losing rather than establishing its connection to our time. Insofar as we understand our time as something like a historical present in a newly globalized uh, form. Condense in a nutshell. Because this literature on objects and things uh, self consciously breaks with post Kantian modern European philosophy's intrinsic connection to history. Other than uh, allegorically, or indeed, one, some might even say ideologically, uh, insofar as it naturalizes a kind of a metaphysics of universal exchange uh, by making universal equivalence its basic metaphysical principle. Uh, to produce what I think of as a kind of uh, displaced existentialism of the loneliness of the thing. This is, this is my other goal. This is its bad Jewian element, right? This, uh, this displaced existentialism. So, so I'm not going to take up objects and things in the way in which it is found in this literature which I'm going to uh, codify as a post-logical positivist, neoclassicist revival of pre-Kantian metaphysics. That's the, these are the three elements in the way of that field. It's post-positivist, neoclassicist revival of pre-Kantian metaphysics. Despite the fact, um, this is I think one thing we need to talk about this afternoon. Despite the fact of what I, what I see as the kind of weird resonances, and I use the term weird here in the full appreciation of the weirdness of the weird. Uh, the weird resonances which this discourse currently has uh, with the art world's residual need for a high level discourse of legitimation, which is what is currently functioning within. Indeed, uh, in particular, within the art world's current attempts to resolve certain crises uh, of contemporary art practice by displacing them into or replacing them with uh, different sorts of discursive performance. And that's obviously part of the institutional transformation uh, of art institutions into <coughs> interestingly not primarily object related uh, <coughs> spaces. So there's something rather ironic going on, which is that object-oriented ontology offers the promise of the object in the form of a discourse which replaces the object. Uh, that's the function of object-oriented ontology. <laughs> to discursively replace the object. Uh, that's a kind of that's not it's that's not if you like anything imminent to it. That's a it is a conjunctural fact about a certain institutional relationship. You say? Yeah. For in this trajectory, the question of history, or the, the question in particular of our time, which is the phrase I'm going to stick with, insofar as it takes a philosophical form, I think it's very rarely that it takes a philosophical form. <clears throat> insofar as it does. It is always secondary and derived, which is a necessary consequence of any philosophical discourse that sets out from a formal ontology. Because a formal ontology will essentially be uh, topological before it is temporal. 
response to that. So, uh, in relation to this, if you like, conjunctural situation, I'm going to set out from what is historically precisely the opposite starting point. Uh, namely, the philosophical tradition for which historical relations are ontologically constitutive. And consequently, within which it is thus possible to speak of something like a historical ontology. That's, that's what I mean by historical ontology. So just a, a, a very brief word about what I do not mean by the phrase historical ontology, which is a kind of paradoxical phrase. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean ontology of history. You know? uh, in the Heideggerian sense of historicity, for example. Categorial, existential, categorical sense of historicity, within which the fundamental sense of ontology remains untransformed by its relation to the word historical, <clears throat> but is rather played out within the historical at the level of something like an original temporality of collective existence or something like that. So, whether that's uh, in a kind of Heideggerian mode or what, what, in, what in being in time Heidegger family calls German Dasein, which is the kind of model of collective uh, ontological existence there, uh, for the temporality of historicity, or the kind of speculative communism of Jean Luc Nancy's uh, reworking of the concept of mid sign or being with, right? which is the, the communist alternative. And I think it's quite interesting that the, uh, the attempt to ontologize history which is parallel to the rather different, uh, more recent attempt to ontologize politics. Uh, the attempt to ontologize history tends to only occur in fascist and liberal variants. There don't seem to be very many, there don't seem to be many other political versions of the ontologization of history. Okay. So, so I don't mean that. The second thing I don't mean is that I don't refer to the Enlightenment tradition of universal history that runs up to, and in my reading, runs aground on Hegel. So rather than Hegel being, if you like, the realization of the Enlightenment tradition of universal history, Hegel is, if you like, the running aground of the Enlightenment version of universal history. Because in Hegel, the problem of universal history is transformed into the rather different problem of world history. And after Hegel, the concept of world history takes on, if you like, a separate, a separate life, where the transformation in the concept of world transforms that Hegelian concept of world history. Rather, what I mean by historical ontology is something like a successor to that Hegelian um, space. So a post-Hegelian conceptual space within which the problem of the philosophy of history no longer appears as that of the narrative unity of a universal history. So it's not a problem of a single narrative, which is the rather simplified form in which it's criticized by famous, most famously by Leotard, of course. Uh, a universal history which is internal to some homogeneous temporal continuity. Uh, but rather it appears as a temporization of historical time or historical historical temporization of time more generally, which cannot be separated, and this is the, the residual Hegelian dialectical side, which can't be separated from the content of history. So the post-Hegelian tradition will refuse to theorize historical time separately from the determinate content, or the eventual content of history, which is thus internally differentiated and disjunctive in a, in a manner that is over-determined by the geopolitical character of the concept of the world, which is, becomes developed particularly in the post-war period. So the philosophical weakness of the treatment of history in the, in the school of objects and things, and I'm particularly thinking here about Deleuze, because I think it matters particularly in Deleuze. I think it, I think it should matter to Deleuzeans that Deleuze doesn't have a concept of history. The philosophical weakness of the treatment of history of that tradition, specifically in relation to Leurs, is the assumption of precisely the equivalence between a philosophical concept of history and the historicist conception of time 
as universal, continuous, and homogeneous. The conception of time, that 20th century philosophy of historical time, has been united in rejecting. And if you were to write, if you like, a history of 20th century philosophy of time, historical time, I think that the only thing that people would agree with, the only thing that Heidegger and Benjamin and Althusser agree about is the critique of historicism. Uh, and yet, uh, historicism is still a model for the rejection of history in the object-oriented tradition. So I think there's a non-engagement between post-historicist philosophy of historical time uh, and the, the object-oriented tradition. So what I'm going to do in this talk uh, is take this concept of historical ontology specifically in relation to the artwork uh, and consider the, the effect of the changing artistic function of documentation within the historical ontology of the artwork. Okay. So I'm going to use this phrase historical ontology of the artwork to define the field. Uh, and this historical ontology is also a critical ontology uh, in something like a broadly for Coldian sense of a critical ontology of the present. Right? So, so the historical ontology of the artwork is a critical ontology and is also, if you like, a genius critically genealogical ontology. Uh, but I'm going to do this specifically through Walter Benjamin. Uh, that's the variant of the critique of historicism I'm going to use. So with regard to the concept of art, and this will be my first section, uh, this will involve a post rather than an anti-Kantian anti problematic about objects. That will be my first section. Uh, and then in the second section, uh, internally to a post Galian problematic of things, or what Walter Benjamin calls the historical existence of things. I take this phrase from, from Benjamin, the historical existence of things. Okay. So, two, uh, two sections. So the first, the first section is on the concept of contemporary art as post-conceptual art. Okay. Um, and it's about the relationship between the concepts of Aesthetic, in, aesthetic concept and image. Okay, these are the, the, the three concepts, the articulation of which I want to suggest define something that is ontologically distinctive about contemporary art, understood post conceptually. So, the, the genealogy of a, critical, of a critical concept of contemporary art as a post conceptual art. I want to suggest, can be schematically presented by the reduction of the critical meaning of 20th century Western art to three competing articulations of the relationship between two basic philosophical concepts. Initially, uh, first articulated in the unity of a systematic opposition uh, in Kant. So the first two concepts are aesthetic uh, and concept, or the aesthetic and the conceptual. And these are the three articulations, really, uh, which take us from essentially late, late 19th century up to late 20th century arts, if you like. I take these to be three competing, crit simultaneously critical and practical problematics in which the practical problematic enacts or actualizes as the historical ontology of the artwork, the imminent logic of the critical problematic. Yeah. So the, uh, I'll just summarize, summarize and then I'll say something about each of them. So the first one is aesthetic art, or well, the projection of the absolute aesthetic dimension, uh, sorry, the project of the absolutization of the aesthetic dimension of the art. The project of treating art as if what is most artistically important about it is its aesthetic dimension. That's what I mean by the aesthetic concept. It's just in a sense it's Kant's concept. So philosophically that derives from the late 18th century, but uh, practically as a movement it derives from the late 19th century. Conceptual art in its like, canonical sense from the mid-60s 
used with a capital C to mark the restricted historical extension of the term. It went constructed through the critical self-understanding of that uh, self-designating canonical tradition of the mid to late 60s. This is, if you like, an inversion of the aesthetic project. It's the project for the absolutization of the conceptual dimension of art. And what happens in the inversion of this project uh, is the conceptual unification uh, of the arts into art in the singular, or the generic concept of art. So, so there's a move from plurality to singularity it, when there's this in, it, conceptual inversion from aesthetic to concept. Uh, then there's the third, uh, the third articulation which I'm calling post-conceptual art, which I take to be speculatively identical to the concept of contemporary art, which explores the dialectics of the aesthetic and conceptual components internal to all works of art in the wake of the critique of the, both of the attempts uh, at reduction, the aesthetic reduction and the conceptual reduction. Uh, it's not just that it follows them uh, historically in chronological historical time, is that it reflectively incorporates the consequences of the dual critique into its critical self-understanding. So that means it that means that in its strategic use of the aesthetic, it has to incorporate and in some way deal with, both critically and in a practical way, the problems of the aesthetic that are revealed in the conceptual critique of the aesthetic. So it's not just that it comes off, it has to, this is the Hegelian side of this argument, it has to reflectively incorporate previous history, otherwise it doesn't count as history. So time is not simply chronological, uh, time is, is modern in the sense that only, only the new moves time forward, right? standard, that standard sense. So aesthetic art gets its philosophical concept from Kant, and its contradictory art institutional reality in 19th century aestheticism. And it runs up to the post-war decline of formal medium-specific modernism into the historically conditioned aesthetic formalism of the, of the late Greenberg. Because what happens in the 60s is that when the historical logic of Greenberg's criticism runs into the ground, Greenberg regresses to aesthetic discourse. So that he gives up on, if you like, the more Canadian side of his discourse uh, and becomes a kind of in a way, a late 19th century thinker, a kind of psychologized Kantian, right, in which he, he propounds uh, essentially a Hubian aesthetic in the name of Kant, because he's psychologizing. The founding incoherence of this, uh, this concept derives from its repression of the conceptual conditions of its own discourse. That is to say, its presupposition uh, of a received system of the arts, essentially the Renaissance system of the arts, which is then transformed or transposed into a theory of mediums, but essentially it's historically received. And it represses the necessarily conceptual character of the critical intelligibility of the historical dimension of art, if you like, upon which it itself often relies. At its limit, it conceives the acknowledgments of these conditions, but only within the experience of the work, if you like, as an end of art. So, uh, in late Greenberg, uh, like as reread by late Arthur Danto, ironically, uh, art is re aestheticized and de historicized. But in being de historicized, uh, it counts, if you like, as the end of art in the sense of the, the modern historical concept of art. At its limit, the attempt to absolutize the aesthetic dimension of the arts turns into its opposite, namely the critical establishment of their conceptual conditions. So in the, in the UK conceptual art context, this is, there is, if you like, there's an emblematic epiphany here in this, this switch, this moment of reversal of aestheticism into conceptual art, uh, which is recounted by Charles Harrison in terms of uh, 
his first visit to New York when he was the uh, he was the editor of Studio International, and he was a Greenbergian at the time, in the, in the mid-60s. And he'd been to, he'd been to see Greenberg, um, and Greenberg had explained to him, as he'd already written at great length, about how you had, you had to go and stand in front of large monochrome paintings in downtown Soho galleries, <coughs> and you had to just stand there and concentrate until you got until you experienced what, what Greenberg famously called the wow, which was uh, the experience of aesthetic quality, the, the uh, inarticulable experience of aesthetic quality. Um, and so Charles Harrison went down to uh, the downtown galleries and sat in front of some very large monogram paintings for a long time. Um, and he failed to experience the wow. Uh, and at this point he had a choice. At this point, he could decide that he was aesthetically unequipped to appreciate art and uh, that he needed a new career, uh, as art criticism was not his, not his vocation. Uh, or he could recognize that what for Greenberg uh, was the immediacy of aesthetic quality was in fact an incredibly elaborate discursive construction um, and that, if you like, he, he had the experience at the beginning of the phenomenology, right? He realized that immediacy did not exist, right? essentially. Uh, there was no such thing. So, in its place came an emphasis on the establishment of the conceptual conditions of the intelligibility of the artwork, including theory of the aesthetic as a conceptual condition for the aesthetic appreciation of the work leads to the inversion or reversal of the project of aesthetic art into the exploratory project of the absolutization of the conceptual dimension of art. Or, uh, if we acknowledge it in its more negative dialectical dimension, the project for the absolutization of anti-aesthetics is essentially a negative project. This was the self-understanding uh, of art historically canonical conceptual art, that's to say, those New York artists who declared themselves to be so. And again, as was the case with the aesthetic project, the experimental absolutization led to the re-establishment uh, of the limit, namely the recognition of the ineliminable aesthetic dimension associated with the material aspects of the presentation of any work. However, uh, aesthetically unconventional <coughs> or unamenable to conventional forms of aesthetic judgment. Okay, so the restoration of the aesthetic at the limit of the conceptual uh, is a restoration independent of the conventional history of received aesthetic forms. So the project of conceptual absolutization was forced to acknowledge the limit of de-aestheticization in the always temporarily bounded aesthetic neutral, in an always temporarily bounded aesthetic neutralization, and became instead a search for strategies of aesthetic self-negation. So in a way, what happens, conceptual art turns into post-conceptual art at the point at which conceptual purism is replaced with strategic aesthetic self-negation. That's, that's the project. Or the search for what, what a long time earlier Duchamp would call aesthetic indifference. The problem, of course, was the inherent institutional tendency that any aesthetic aspect of a work's material presentation, and then including its documentation, which I'll come back to, this is an important point about documentation, becomes invested with an aesthetic significance on a par with the significance of the work, of which it is the material instantiation, but with which it is not identical. And once you realize, if you like, the disjunction between the notion of material instantiation and the notion of identity, then the aesthetic aspect of any material instantiation become, is open to become part of the work. This is the word, it's not identical with this aesthetic instantiation. <clears throat> so defensive or strategic anti-aesthetic could be no more than a transitional holding position for conceptual art. In order to maintain a more active, critically conceptual practice, 
It had to engage the equally constitutive relations of the aesthetic and the conceptual in a dialectical way. And these are the general terms of what I'm going to call the post-conceptual. So if there is such a thing as post-conceptual dialectics of taste, for example, it's, not a, it's neither a dialectic internal to taste, which is impossible, right? Since dialectic is necessarily conceptual and aesthetic is in principle non-conceptual, nor is it a Kantian dialectic of conflicting concepts of the basis of the possibility of aesthetic judgments of taste, but it's a dialectic of taste and non-taste, taking the form of dialectics of a multiplicity of different forms of taste on the one hand, and a multiplicity of ways of negating their non-conceptual status on the other. The primary means of which is, a step, is uh, through establishing their relational character, uh, or the, the relational character of their historical meaning. Right? The primary mood. And the primary terrain, if you like, of this post-conceptual dialectics of taste and non-taste within contemporary art uh, is neither aesthetic nor conceptual, but the terrain uh, of that dialectic is the image. So, there's a switch in contemporary art from a 150 year period in which critically and practically the conceptual ground of, of, of struggle is over the relation between the conceptual and the aesthetic to something which is internal to the concept of image. <clears throat> so image is the central ontological structure of what I'm calling post-conceptual contemporary works. Not because it's the carrier uh, of the aesthetic. I mean, for conceptual art, the problem with the image, the image was the enemy because it carried the aesthetic. Right? So the aesthetic aspect of the image was the threat to early conceptual art. It's not the aesthetic aspect of the image. It's rather the mutual difference of the image from conceptual and aesthetic alike. So image is a third term. Uh, in its technical Kantian sense, and it's surprising that there's not more work by Kantians on the concept of the image, actually, which is quite interesting. There's very little work by Kantians on the concept of image. There's a lot on the concept of imagination. Very little on the concept of image. The image is the mediating term between aesthetic and logic, in which intuitions achieve a non-conceptual synthesis, in the first critique, say, and concepts are rendered sensible by the schematism and hence become capable of organizing sensible intuitions into cognitive experience. Or again, in a slightly more difficult, uh, a more interesting way, the critique of judgment power, image is the non-conceptual but more than merely sensible form in which aesthetic ideas become actual. Okay, so image is strange because image is, uh, it's non-conceptual but it's more than sensible. You know, so it's, it's a strange, uh, and that is the medium for the actualization of aesthetic ideas. So the more, yeah, the more of the image is actually materially less, since what is distinctive about the image, of course, in its classical philosophical form, is its twofold character uh, as, a, as, a, as a mode or a means of derealization of the object. Right? Images derealize objects. So the image abstracts figure and form from the sensible into an ideal ontologically ambiguous self-sufficiency. That's the function of the image. Famously, the image at once presents an absent thing and designates the thing presented uh, as unreal because it is absent. You know? In other words, the image points in two directions at once. It's, the image is constitutively ontologically ambiguous. That's the power of the image. It points to the presence of the unreal and the absence of the real forms both those functions simultaneously. It's, a, it's an absence that becomes real as, a mode, as the mode of reality of the unreal. Okay, that's the classical concept of the image. Right? Now, aesthetic may carry the image, but the image qua image escapes the aesthetic. That's my point. Right? It's a non-conceptual form of intelligibility which is amenable to carrying or bearing aspects of concepts in a non-conceptual, but more than sensible form. So judgments about images are not judgments of taste, 
uh, in any directly or technically aesthetic sense. Image, judgments about images are, are a separate and unexplored category, right, philosophically. Most judgments about art, and particularly most judgments about contemporary art, I want to suggest, are judgments about relations between images. Right? They're not aesthetic judgments, and they're not really conceptual judgments. They're judgments about the relations between images. The dialectics of taste or aesthetic and non-taste concept within post-conceptual art is a dialectics internal to the sphere of images. Now this structural centrality of the image to post-conceptual art has of course been technologically reinforced since the early 90s by digital developments in technologies of image production which have allowed digital imagery to become a kind of meta-medium. Not a medium. Digital imagery is not a medium. It's a, it's a meta-medium. These developments have, to, to a certain extent, although not fundamentally, I think, modified the concept of the image by taking it closer to the concept of information, uh, as, of course, as it always appeared in the 1960s from the standpoint of information theory, the information theoretical dimension of conceptual art. Uh, and it's this informational problematic which has made the image, the digital image, the dominant matter medium of generic contemporary art. Because it's through its capacity for an infinite multiplicity of possible materializations of particular works that the digital image carries the post conceptual ontology of contemporary art. The fracturing of the identity between the work and any particular material manifestation. It's not just that there's a moment of non-identity between the work and its material manifestations. It's a bit like there's, there's a fracturing of it in principle between any of its existing material manifestations. Extends the range of materials involved internally to the scope of the work. Uh, and it extends it, for example, as we're on to talk about, it extends it to documentation. Yeah. And hence to the archive creating a new dimension to the role played by institutions in the constitutions of artworks. And one of the things that's currently happening in a lot of major museums, uh, where, they, um, where they're, they're rethinking and reorganizing and restructuring their archives, is a kind of split in the, concept, in the classical concept of the archive internally to the museum institution into, on the one hand, uh, an archiving function which becomes wholly digital. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, a, I feel like a, a residual material archive, uh, the function of which becomes directly artistic. In other words, the, the, the archive splits into its digital side, which is its archiving function, and its materiality, which places the material aspects of the archive things out of the archive and into the collection because there's no difference between the relation of the work to the materiality of its archival documentation and to any other material instantiation associated with the work. Um, we saw this in a kind of blatant and opportunistic way recently uh, at the Tate in London, particularly in Tate Britain, where they produced a show called, it's uh, only recently closed, Conceptual Art in Britain from uh, 1964 to 1972, um, which if you were from the outside looked like a show about conceptual art in Britain. But actually it was a show designed to move materials from the archive into the collection via an exhibition. Because what they did was when they were organizing the archive, was they discovered all these letters and photo documentation that they'd acquired when various British conceptual artists had died over the last 10 or 15 years, that had been put into the archive. And somebody realised that there was, a, there was in fact no material, conceptual, intellectual distinction essentially between the character of these materials and the character of some of the materials which had historically been exhibited by these artists. Um, given the character, if you like, of conceptual presentation. Uh, so they had a whole load of stuff which they got for free 
that didn't have any value as such other than document archival. So they had a show called Conceptual Art in Britain, through which they processed a load of this stuff, uh, which then at the end of the show went into the collection uh, as now canonically works of Conceptual Art in Britain because they've done the canonical show. Uh, and of course, they completely revalorized this material because you know, now this is part of the, uh, the artistic canon. It's not, uh, it's not merely uh, documentation. So I'm, I'm interested in, if you like, I, I, that is, if you like, an opportunistic uh, institutional practice, but I'm interested in the deeper, if you like, what is it about changes in the concept of the artwork or in the ontology of the artwork which made that possible, and which, that, which is enacted by that movement. So it's no longer news that in recent decades the institution of the museum uh, has gone under a period of sustained transformation, and that as part of this process, all of its constitutive categories, that is to say, collection, preservation, documentation, archiving, classification, curation, display, and exhibition, these are the basic institutional have been called into question along with the system of relations which have been historically established between them. New practices have blurred or eroded the boundaries between these categories and have led to the antiquation uh, of others. So what's quite interesting is uh, what was happening in the mid-1960s and when you look at the famous essay by Adorno, for example, on art and the arts, which is about the erosion of the borders between the arts, right? which is his correct, if you like, diagnosis of what was happening fundamentally in our practice of the 60s. <coughs> now we have exactly the same process happening, which is a blurring of the boundaries of the institutional categories of the, uh, of the art museum, <coughs> where the relation between collection, preservation, documentation, archiving, classification, curation, display, and exhibition has been eroded. Right? So, so in a way, as a belated response to the move from a plurality of artistic mediums to a generic concept of art, we have a move from a plurality of uh, museological functions uh, to one, if you like, integrated systemic uh, museological functions, to which the, these become the, um, the residual aspects. Now, the causes of these processes have been multiple and political, economic, and technological primarily. But the, the combined effect of these, of these processes is structural. So in the case of the Art Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in particular, it's also been reinforced by the changes in the, the concept of art since the 60s, which have been incorporated into institutional practice. So a post-conceptual ontology of contemporary art has developed not only through the critical weight and dissemination of new artistic practices, but also through changes in art space and the social space uh, of the production and presentation of art. Because of course the museum space is also now the primary space of production, post-installation. Um, it's the space of production as well as presentation and archiving. So everything is happening in the same space. Now, most of the literature that discusses these changes has been sociological uh, or has focused on the changing role of the curator and the growing importance of temporary exhibitions relative to the display of collections. That's what the literature is primarily focused on. Uh, and we've had three, if you like, three art historical sub-disciplines were invented and followed one another in very rapid succession. Yeah. Museum studies followed by curatorial studies. And over the last decade, we've had, we have exhibition studies, particularly the history of exhibition as a disciplinary practice. The economic and political reasons within institutions themselves, emphasis has shifted from objects and works to visitors and the qualities of their experiences. Right? And the qualities of the experience of the visitor that the museum is interested in is not what a Greenberg called aesthetic experience or the wow, okay. 
It is, if you like, the total experience of the visitor in their interaction with the institution. From the person standing on the entrance door, obviously by the shop, which is a crucial, crucial element, uh, and everything else in the institution. Total uh, experiential thing. What hasn't really been paid much attention to is, on the one hand, the way in which the conventional distinction between the collection on the one hand and the documents in the archive on the other has collapsed in this process. The way in which it is a consequence uh, of the ontology of the post-conceptual work and what the implications of this collapse are, uh, both for our practices and for our museums. So in relation to critical writing, uh, we've had what was called the archival impulse. This is the October, this is the book of Foster. Um, but this is more than an artistic preoccupation with the fragility of memory under the conditions of waning historicality, which is what it is essentially there. Uh, it's more fundamental and to do with the archival status of the artwork itself and its indifference from documentation. In contrast to that literature, and more boldly, as always, uh, Boris Groys, uh, in, in the text that he wrote originally for Documentary 11 back in 2002, proposed that we're witnessing an epochal shift, what he says, from artwork to art documentation, uh, which he, is, which he, uh, he wants to uh, you know, lo locate as being conditioned by what he calls the age of biopolitics. And on, on the Groysian version of this, installa installation of the documentation of art events produces a new kind of bio-art. Uh, and it's a bio-art because it's the function of institutions to make, document, to make documentation live. Okay? So the bio-function of the museum is the enlivening of documentation. Under this scenario, the artwork, under the Groysian scenario, the artwork disappears. So it's a kind of end of art thesis. Um, an end of art, but life of documentation thesis. The work of the installation of documentation is no longer to make art, but in fact the reverse. It becomes the art of making living things out of artificial ones. This is the phrase, that's a quote from Groys. This is, the, this is the essay called Art in the Age of Biopolitics. Art drops out and we're left with documentation and it's enlivening in the by spaces of art. That's all there is to it. So in a, in a sense there is, there's a complete elimination in the Groys of a difference between art practice and uh, the practice of documentation. Art practice simply is a, do, a, a practice of documentation. However, let us not rush to this conclusion just yet. Not least because so much contemporary art <coughs> fails. I think we have to agree that most contemporary art fails. Right? So contemporary art fails twice. Uh, most contemporary art, 99% of contemporary art, fails <coughs> early on because it fails to achieve any social actuality. Right? So it's just, it exists solely in the relation to the artist and the small group of friends. Right? It has no social and certainly no potential historical actuality. Within the, whatever, 1% that acquires social actuality through its relation to institutions, a lot of that art fails, I want to suggest, at the level of artistic experience, or what Adorno calls artistic experience. This is what Kunstelich Erfahrung, this is what Juliana is going to translate back into aesthetic experience, and I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it fails because it wants to live in the same way that other things that live live. Right? It wants to be enlivened, but it has no way, if you like, of distinguishing between what it means to live as the work of art and what it means to live as anything else. Because it's Grice's theory that there is no difference. It's just that the art institution is what makes the art as documentation live. And when it lives, it lives in the same sense that anything else lives. Right? But insofar as there is to be such a thing as art, ontologically speaking, 
It will have to live in some distinctive, ontologically distinctive way. It has to have a life which is not the life of life in general. What this work wants is it wants the historical avant-garde's putative end state of tomorrow immediately. In other words, the disintegration of the relation between art and the rest of life without having to transform society along the way as its condition, right? It wants to just go straight to everyday life. As if the magical power of art space alone were enough, if you like, to realize the avant-garde project. And this is the gross thesis that it is enough. Insofar as our institutions continue to exist in their specific difference from other kinds of arts, and sorry, other kinds of cultural space, what is presented within them would be able to live there rather than being merely interned, which is what most things are merely interned in these institutions, only through the ongoing production and critical instantiation of a specific difference between the mode of life of the artwork and the mode of life of an uncultural cultural object. Yeah. However ironical, dialectical, or purely differential the character of that difference may be. Yeah. So the question, the question is not, and this is Groys's question, Groys's question is, how does documentation come alive in the museum? That's not like the question. It's not that. The question is rather, how does the becoming art? Of, what does the becoming art of documentation have to tell us about the historical ontology of the art world and its relation to the practices of collecting and archiving? Right? So that's my that's my question. So I'm going to I'm going to address this to, quickly through two two texts by Walter Benjamin about collecting, the two famous texts which is the, the Unpacking My Library text, the talk about collecting, uh, that's published in 1931, uh, and the later, slightly later essay, uh, Extract from the Arcades Project, on uh, Edward Fook, Collector and Historian, which comes from 37. It's interesting to compare these two texts about collecting, because there's a difference, both from the, both, uh, from the point of view of their standpoint and from their point of view of genre. In the first case, we have the radical individualism of the bourgeois conception of the collector, which is mirrored, uh, if you like, in the essay form of the essay itself. And in the second uh, case, we have the standpoint of what Benjamin calls the historical situation, as perceived by what he calls a pioneer of a materialist consideration of art. So the question, if you like, of the materialist, the materialist history of exhibitions, right? Uh, is, I think, what's at stake in Benjamin's Edward uh, Fouke essay. So, I'm just going to say three things about this. Something in relation to history, something in relation to art, and something in relation to the image. You know? So, nestling within the autobiographical narrative of Unpacking My Library is an almost personalist theory of collecting as the privileged medium of the historical existence of objects. This is Benjamin's phrase, right? It's the function uh, of the collection to give historical existence to objects by putting them in relation to other objects. That's what things become historical by being related to other objects uh, across which there is, if you like, a, a differential of historical time. This hinges here on the private collector's passion for possession and the fact that for a collector, ownership is the most intimate relationship you can have to things. This is described as a relationship to objects which does not emphasize their functional utilitarian value, that's to say their usefulness, so usefulness, but studies and loves them <coughs> as, quote, the scene, the stage of their fate. That's what the collector does. Collectors loves things as things for their historical existence. Right? In themselves for their historical existence. So that's like a doubling of the the ontology of the thing <coughs> and the relation here, which within current ontological debates would be a kind of contradiction between, between thing and relation. Okay. It involves placing them in, within a collection of books that he's talking about his library, a library, and subjecting them to what Benjamin calls the order and mild boredom of the catalogue okay, in the construction of the archive. It is only in the chaos and confusion of the private collection, this is his phrase, the chaos and confusion, or what he calls the relative disorder of the, private, of the private collection, 
which is associated with the passion of the collector, and with, and hence with a certain uh, our contingent individuality, that objects are said to get their due. This loving, loving study of the object produces uh, what Benjamin calls a rebirth of the old world of the object, or, and this is the phrase, the renewal of the, of the existence of the object, the renewal of the existence of the object. So acquisition, curation in its original sense of care for the object and archiving are existentially united in the private collector in a manner that public connections, collections cannot match. You know? Even though they are, as Benjamin says, less objectionable socially and more useful academically. Interpretation, which is an effect of the documentary location of the object in the magical encyclopedia of the background, uh, and the claim here is implied that every collection is a magical encyclopedia, appears implicit in the physiognomical act of acquisition itself. Hence, we have the famous phrase from Benjamin, you're probably familiar collectors are the physiognomists of the world. Now, Benjamin knows that this model is historically redundant, the private bourgeois collector. Okay. Quotation, only in extinction is the collector comprehended. Uh, he writes in a, a passage including a very rare reference in the footnote to Hegel. This is the only significant reference to Hegel that I can, can think of in Benjamin's work. Nonetheless, the philosophical terms of this idea are uh, of extinction as the condition of comprehension uh, are rather different from Hegel's and they uh, set the terms for a more socialised and historical material model of collection that we find in the, in the Foucault essay in which collection appears and this is a, another interesting phrase as the practical man's answer to the aporias of theory and that's what Benjamin said in other words, the aporias of art theory are not resolved theoretically, they're resolved practically by the act of collection, by the act of collection. The theory here to which Benjamin refers is what he calls the recent past of Marxist theory of art, which elsewhere, uh, famously in, in, the, uh, in the Arcades project, uh, he describes Marxist art, Marxist art theory as one moment swaggering the next uh, scholastic. And this is, if you like, the antinomy of Marxist the, the overreaching historical claim on the one hand and this kind of scholasticism on the other. Which, in the words of the, the, the sixth the thesis on Feuerbach, divorced from human practice and the comprehension of that practice can only end in mysticism. Right? So what I'm suggesting is that Benjamin applies Marxist critique of scholasticism from the sixth thesis on Feuerbach to Marxist art theory. Right? designated as scholastic. So Benjamin locates Fuchs contribution as a collector to his being, quote, the first to expand the specific character of mass art, and thereby to have cleared the way for art history to be freed from the fetish of the master's signature. Uh, this was, of course, a part that was rather less followed than Benjamin might have hoped that it was about to be like, because, of course, the fetish of the master's signature remains the principle of the collection. I mean, it is, it's on the basis of the fetish of the master's signature that those documents moved from the tape written archive into the collection. <laughs> uh, so that's still, that's still going. Reconstructing the theoretical meaning of this practice, Benjamin expounds a general theory of the historical ontology of art in which critical and institutional rece reception act retroactively on the being of the artwork. And this is the famous quotation. For the dialectical historian concerned with works of art, these works integrate that for history as well as that after history. That's the second bit that's important, and it's by virtue of that after history that that for history is recognizable as involved in a continuous process of change. So, in other words, the continuity of historical change is the product, if you like, the retrospective illusion uh, of the relation between four history and art history. Uh, elsewhere, when he's discussing tradition uh, in, re 
relation to the critique of, uh, of like the illusion of the continuity, Benjamin says, you know, tradition is the practice of the illusion of continuity. So it's not that, if you like, continuity is a philosophical mistake. Continuity is the, is the self-consciously illusory result of the practice of connection. So artworks are subject to constant transformation by the system of relations into which they enter as part of their reception, and that retroactively uh, changes what they are. In other words, it changes their ontology. It doesn't just change our interpretation. This isn't about retrospection, it's about retroaction. As part of this historical understanding is itself an afterlife of that which has been understood, that's quote, and quote, whose pulse can be felt in the present. So it becomes the critical task of the collection to, quote, put to work an experience with history so understood. In other words, a history, this is again another phrase from Benjamin, History that is originary for every present. This is the important point about Benjamin's concept of origin. Okay? Origin is relative to the specificity of every present in which is new. It's not in the past. Such a putting to work, he said, in these famous metaphors, to blast the epoch out of its rarefied historical continuity. Last, the life out of the epoch and the work out of the life work. So there's this sort of serial separation or extraction. In such a way as to result paradoxically in the experience of the life work in the work and of the epoch in the, in the life work and the course of history in the epoch which is preserved and superseded. And again, interestingly, Benjamin uses these, um, these Hegelian terms. Yeah. So what is this historic, this, what I'm going to call a constructivist historical ontology, because it's retroactive, it's constructivist. Uh, what does it tell us uh, about art? <coughs> so, the first thing to note here is that the identity of the post-conceptual work is not tied to any particular materialization, but is coterminous with the temporally open totality of its materializations in a reflective relation to its idea. In other words, it has an eminently constructive and processual character. Okay? So the, the idea, if you like, preserves its virtuality, if you, as the other tradition would say, relative to its, to its materializations. Each materialization becomes at once a documentation of the work and a set of materials for a subsequent work, or presentation of the work, and a subsequent documentation of the work. In this respect, the work includes its own documentation. This is one fundamental proposition that follows from this. Every artwork includes its own documentation and thereby its own archive too. Is the, the differentiation breaks down. Now, Groys oddly says something rather peculiar, which is that artworks, quote, cannot refer to art because they are art. This is one of these sort of clever reductions, like logic chopping pieces of analytical philosophy you get from Gross. Artworks cannot refer to art because they are, are art. Consequently, he thinks that art documentation, because it refers to art, can't be art. That's why it can't be art, because it refers to art. But this is obviously a sophistical argument. Since modern art has been bound up with a certain self-referentiality since its beginning, and I mean, the basic claim of modernism was that art was purely self-referential that art was nothing else than a reference to itself. It was exhausted by self-reference. Contemporary art's post-conceptual art, on the other hand, is an art in which the artistic materiality of the work and its documentary function are combined. And what distinguishes works is the different relation between the materiality of what is presented as the work and the documentary function of that materiality. This is clearest in the temporal logic of performance or, or the art event or, by extension, the performative or eventual aspect of any work, but it's equally the case in the disjunction between the material and the conceptual components of any work, be it conceptual in inspiration or just a result of the extended relational structure uh, that it enters into. In other words, anything that is historical is relational. <coughs> so everything, if you like expands conceptually the system of relations which render it intelligible. 
this finds its institutional correlate in the growing recognition of an indifference between our work and documentation. The process, as I said, has been reinforced by the character, uh, the change in the character of the curator from a custodian of a collection to an exhibition impresario, which has aesthetically orphaned the collection. Because in a way, one of the problems that museum institutions have at the moment is that the collection is orphaned. No one is looking after the collection because curators are no longer people who look after the collections. Curators are people who put on shows. Uh, and the other people that were in the curation department who don't put on shows have been given new job descriptions as researchers. So curation has disappeared into exhibition, organisation and research and the collection is there. That's enough. But, um, I should stop. No, you, no, no, not right now, but maybe conclude. I conclude. It's, I will conclude. <laughs> as you say, fit of course. I could conclude that. You can take five, a few more minutes. I could conclude that. <laughs> I can give you one die. I'm going to give you one die. Yeah. yeah. That's it's just right. two. Um, well, uh, there's, there's no rush, but I'm going to give you the if you like. I'm going to give you the sum a summary diagram. Oh, amazing. Oh, which is that? It's going to remain silent. Okay. This is a diagram that, that attempts to uh, combine, if you like, the the. the Elements of the uh, ontology of the work with their institutional mediation. So, prior to what I'm calling contemporary art, where the like the fundamental issue within any work was what was the relation between the aesthetic and the conceptual component, appears institutionally, <coughs> is retrospectively institutionally summarised in Smithson's distinction between site and non site. In other words, site and non-site becomes the institutional materialization of that uh, dialectic between the aesthetic and conceptual internal, internal to the work. Yeah. Um, because there is no site other than defined by a non-site, and there is no non-site that is not itself a special kind of site. Right? That's Mrs. Uh, what I've done to that is that I've, I've then, if you like, added, uh, if you like, what happens when you uh, when you transpose that uh, those two dialectics like into the medium into the medium of the image, uh, which is to say that the rather than appearing, if you like, as oppositional pairs <coughs> that have external relations to each other, they appear as as, as internal as relations which are internal to the concept of the image. So the move from that. From the first two layers to the third layers is a kind of you know, a rendering of the previous relations, which are conceived as oppositions, to internal image relations to the image. Where that's like right, that is the structure of the image itself. I think it's classical form. Thank you, Peter.